Okay, there we go. Thank you for coming to the ISA Zoom session. Uh, this session, we're going to have Mr. Brad Miller of flybass.com. Brad Miller's person, when I first got a computer, I you know, had to jump on it right away and figure out about this uh, smallmouth fish and stuff. And Brad Miller was the first thing to come up in my search. So <laughs> he's, Brad Miller's always been my guy to I go to for all my fly fishing and stuff when I purchase. He yeah. does everything that he sells. So I trust him 100%. And he's got some great uh, foam bodies that help me with my tying with, you know, with my eyesight. So without further ado, Mr. Brad Miller of flybass.com. All right, thanks. Thanks, Terry. Terry, do you remember, um, was that your, your meeting that I was down there about five, six years ago, or was that, was that you guys? Might uh, have been a different uh, alliance down there. I, I went, I was at a meeting down there somewhere. Um, you know, that was in Columbus, Ohio, I think. Anyway, bottom line is we're here now. But yeah, um, I started, uh, I've been fly fishing for a long time. Started out for trout in southeastern Minnesota and western Wisconsin. And um, lived in Colorado for a year. I spent a lot of time in Montana. And when we got back from Colorado in about 1976, um, we were wondering what we were going to do for fly fishing. And so we started fishing for some pan fish and stuff. And then we, went, we took a river trip um, with a guide you guys are probably familiar with, Tim Hoshlog, here a long time ago. And uh, he was using foam poppers back then. And he got those from somebody else, but pretty much a similar design of what we do today. Um, so we started fly fishing for smallmouth on the Mississippi. And, and it, it was, you know, we've got some excellent, uh, the upper Mississippi up here is what? It's almost, like a, it's almost like a trout stream up here at the right time of year. It's just a big, it's big and wide, but it's relatively shallow and it can get real, real nice and clear. And uh, great, great fly fishing water. So <clears throat> anyway, um, I started fly, flybass.com as an online store, I think in 05 or 04. And um, basically the idea behind flybass.com was to offer people um, a way to get into fly fishing without having to remortgage their home. Um, so much of the equipment that you read about um, is so expensive um, that I think it's, it's uh, dissuades certain people from getting into it. They think it's a rich man's sport and we all know that it's not. So my goal was to offer stuff on the site that would be affordable for most people. And so that's kind of how flybass.com got going. Um, I think the most, I got some, um, I sell rods, some rods, a relatively small selection of rods and reels because there's so much of that out there. Uh, most of what I sell are fly, fly um, tying materials. I fly, I sell a lot of peak vices um, just because the neat thing about peak is um, they have a minimum uh, retail charge that you can charge. So my pricing is the same as Cabela's, for example, uh, or Bass Pro Shop. So that's, that's allowed me to sell a lot of peak vices. If anybody's ever in a neighborhood for a peak vice, um, the, big, the big difference with the peak is the size of the a pedestal, the six by six pedestal. Um, you can always, you can actually use it to work out with if you wanted to when you weren't tying flies. The reason why that six by six pedestal is so nice is because when you're cranking on a fly, um, let's say you're spinning deer hair, God forbid, or whatever, you can really crank on them and, and that pedestal won't rock um, like it will with a smaller uh, pedestal. So anyway, speak, uh, peak bias. Let's get into this um, blockhead popper. And what I do is um, I use uh, <clears throat> these 33, let's see it there, it's a little hard to see, but these 33 903 kink shanked mustads. And I, I sit down if I'm watching TV and I'll, I'll pre-wrap a whole bunch of them with some kind of thread that I don't use a whole lot of. So I can, if I've got some thread laying around, I don't, I've never used or whatever, I'll wrap it on there. And this is just help, helping for the, the fixation for the glue, okay? So the really the key uh, with these blockheads, I've got, there's three different sizes of the blockheads. 
You can see that obviously it's got the flat bottom and um, small one for pan fish. The medium size is what we typically use for bass, smallmouth largely. Um, and then I've got a larger one. It's got a little bit bigger face to it, so forth. And we use those for largemouth, and I will use them for smallmouth also at times. But the, the key to, to these uh, poppers are to get the, the pilot hole done correctly. And on my uh, flybass.com, there's a blog section there. And I've got a video on how to, how to punch a nice true hole through that blockhead. So you get a nice straight, straight one. But I'll show you how to do it. What I do is, and I use, you can use a, um, uh, like a bodkin type thing. We all got bodkins laying around. They work good. I use a, um, what's called a uh, easy bobbin threader from Rainey's. It's a little bit smaller diameter. And I put it in the back first, right smack dab in the middle. You can see that. And I, I make a little, little hole. You got to make sure when you start your hole on these that you angle the fly so it's straight in both planes. And then I'll, I'll work that in there a little ways. And then I'll turn around and I'll place it about an eighth of an inch above the bottom of that popper body. And I'll start to work that in. And again, I'll turn that. And so as I'm introducing that in there, I'll keep turning it. And it generally comes out smack dab in the back if you've got a pilot hole in the back. Okay. So <clears throat> then I'll... Uh, I use super glue. Everybody has got their own glue that they like. I mean, probably the best kind of glue would be some sort of an epoxy. But I, I haven't got the patience to uh, wait around for epoxy. So I use super glue. So then what you do is, and I just put a, a bead along the top, and then I will get that fly going in there and I'll turn it. And I'll turn it on to shaft and then I'll bring it out so I've got the I've got the eye facing right where I want. One thing I like about these rotary vices is, is that then I can look at the conformation of that fly and make sure that it's it's symmetrical in a couple of different planes. So then what I wind up with is you know, the body with that eye coming out and everything is straight and flat. I want that. I want that body. Um, I want that body so that. Um, I want it fairly flat and fairly close to the bottom of it because one of the biggest mistakes that we make time poppers is that you don't have enough hook gap between the bottom of the popper and the point of the hook. And it's either because the hook is too small um, or the body is too close to the point of the hook. So you have to make sure that you've got plenty of room between the bottom of that popper body and that hook. It makes it so much easier for the fish to grab it and get hooked, get, get well hooked. So then one of my favorite parts about what I use up here, I use a lot of squirrel tail, okay? And, and one of the things I like about squirrel tail is it's almost like a little hobby in it of itself. Um, and some people might think I'm kind of weird when they see me bending over a squirrel along the side of the road, the roadkill, and, and uh, clipping off the, the body of the squirrel. But basically what I do is I always carry shears in my car. And if I'm driving down the road and I see a fresh, try to get a fresh roadkill. <laughs> Don't grab one that's been, you know, run over about 10 times. Try to get a fresh one. If you hit it yourself, that's the best. But um, so I'll pick up the squirrel and just boom, and then clip it off. Um, a big uh, wire cutters worked well too. So then in the, in the old days, I used to take the time and I'd, I'd cut down the tailbone and I'd remove the bone and then open it up and leave it dry. You don't have to do that. All you have to do is pop that tail off. I, I put a nail through it when it's soft and I nail it to the wall of my garage inside. 
And then I probably got right now, I probably got about 10 of them out there. And after about six months, they come out, they're nice and stiff and the hair is really nice. And they make, uh, they make a real good, uh, real good tail material. So you can see here, this one's been used a time or two. So I'll just take a, <clears throat> I'll just take a piece of a squirrel tail here and uh, cut that off. I want that tail, I want that tail to stick about at least an inch or so, maybe an inch and a half out the back of that fly. So then I'm gonna cut her off right there. These things are so easy to tie guys. Um, and you can use different material besides uh, squirrel tail, of course. Why do I like squirrel tail? I like squirrel tail because it's relatively, relatively stiff. And, uh, and it's kind of fun to get it. So I'll, I'll throw this uh, squirrel tail on here. Kind of do some lazy loops to get it started and uh, try to keep it on top. Let's see here, I got a problem with my bobbin here. Um, let's see, okay. Okay, there we go. Anyway, get this baby on here. I got my I got my uh, thread kind of screwed up here. As a matter of fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tie that off real quick. I'm going to move this up on top, and I'm going to grab this other this other thread here because it's not screwed up. So okay. You also want to want to run it back <clears throat> a little bit. You can use bucktail for these, and um, but I like to I like the squirrel tail. It's, it's it doesn't flare out. If you run bucktail and you, and you pull too tight, it'll it'll flare on you, as you may know. So anyway, I got this squirrel tail on here. I'll wrap it forward here. A little bit. Now, what I'm going to do is just take a just a piece of hackle. You can use, you, know, you can use just like chenille, um, just a sparkle chenille or something like that too. The reason I like the hackle is because it adds a little bit, um, a little bit extra flotation to it. So then we'll. Grab the old hack pliers. Incidentally, this is what I use to put my tools in. It's actually a banister. And I put some, some foam packing material on either side so I can stick stuff in it. And just drilled out a whole bunch of holes different ways. It's really nice because I can just pick it up and I can put it away, get it out of the way when I'm not, uh, I'm not tying flies. So with the rotary vise, you know, you can use the rotary vise to, um, to go ahead and spin on material like this. But I, one of the main uses for me with a rotary is being able to check the symmetry and the confirmation of the fly like this. And I can put on another hackle if I wanted to, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do that right now. If you guys, um, I'm, I'm hoping that you guys know how to do the, the finger whip finish if you don't, you know, check out a YouTube video on the um, on, a, on how to do a, a whip finish with your fingers, as opposed to using a tool. Tool works fine, but sometimes if you got to reach over a popper body or something like that, um, it makes it a little tough. Now I can put on some more hack or some other stuff on here, but for all intents and purposes, this fly is uh, almost done. I'll typically take some flat. Um, tinsel uh, eyes like prismatic eyes like this. You can also use these that are have a little bit of, of thickness to them um, and, and they're stick on, but I always put a bead of super glue 
on the side to make sure I get a good fixation, squeeze them on, that type of thing. I'm not going to do it right now, but um, I think I think eyes on a popper, generally speaking, are kind of questionable. The reason being is that if you're if you're a smallmouth bass in the water, this is what this is what you're seeing underwater. You're not seeing an eye staring at you unless your fly is not built correctly and it's lying on its side. But they don't see eyes. Now it's a little bit different with a streamer, because with a streamer, obviously, uh, um, the eyes pay off. I think more so than the eyes. But we like to tie flies, and so we like to put eyes on them just for our own benefit. I think in most cases, um, plus the fact in many cases you're moving those you're moving those hoppers fairly quickly, and they just they just really don't have time to, to zone in on the eyes. So that's basically that's basically it. Pop a couple eyes on there. Um, you can dab some more um, stuff on the different junctions and whatever. But you know you can crank these things out real fast. You just pre-tie the pre-wrap thread on there. Um, I use a size four for the medium size blockhead. I use a size. Let's see. This is a size. This is actually a size two. On a, on a stainless steel one because I do take these down to salt water and um, do some salt water fishing with these poppers. So I use a stainless steel hook on them. Um, you, um, so, uh, the, and usually for the smaller one, the little guys here, I'll run a six or an eight um, king shank on them. So they're, they were great for panfish, obviously. So um, real handy fly, real handy fly to use. Some other types of foam bodies that I sell a fair amount of are the lefties. Um, these are called the lefties inshore popping bugs. And these were designed by Lefty Cray. And um, a little bit longer type of a body to them. They float real well. Um, you have to use a longer, you have to use a two or three X long hook on them because the body's longer um but they um they're nice you know um i i use them uh i use them in, in, in fresh and salt water both they make kind of a cool profile they don't push quite as much water as a blackhead just because you haven't got the face as big of a face on them like that but they're cool cool alternative um and uh, oh, by the way, um, for you guitar players out there or banjo players, this is a, a B string for a, a banjo. And it just makes a really nice bobbin threader um, and just bend them in half. And then I took some heat shrink and slipped it over. So if you know anybody that plays guitar or banjo or mandolin or whatever, you can get some, some wire from them that they had don't use or throw them away. And you can make yourself several of these really nice bobbin threaders. Uh, they work really good. Um, so uh, that's pretty much as far as the blockhead is concerned. Um, and now if you want to turn me over there, Bart, we can look at some of some other stuff here. Hey, uh, Brad. Yeah. Uh, just take a little commercial break here, I guess. Uh... Sure. We'll go ahead and announce that right now it looks like we have uh, 20 people in attendance here. And uh, Mr. Brad Miller will be giving away, I believe, a pair of your mitten scissors. Mitten scissor clamps? Yep, you, mu you must be here to win. And then also <laughs> uh, from the ISA, we have a fly box. I believe John can show you that. And... Uh, We'll be doing a drawing at the end of the session here, and you have to be in attendance. Your yep. names have been written down. So okay. Thank you much. Back to you, Brad. All right. I'll show you guys this thing right now. <clears throat> um, this is called a I'll call a mitten scissor clamp. You squeeze them to get it to, cl to clamp, and then if you squeeze them a couple more times, they'll open up. And it's a mitten scissor clamp. So you can use it to cut stuff. I'll use it to trim hair on a fly if it's not balanced correctly or I'll cut line with it. You don't want to cut metal with it. It's a surgical instrument. 
and um, literally used in surgery. And the guy, you know, guys started using them for fishing and they work fantastic. And one of the, one of the, the biggest thing about them is, you know, you don't need to, you can, you can put it anywhere like a hemostat, but you don't have to stick your fingers through the holes of a hemostat, which, which can be kind of a pain in the butt, especially if it's cold out. Um, <laughs> sometimes up here, we use them for ice fishing all the time because, you know, we've got gloves on. And so, you know, whether if you've got gloves on or not, it doesn't matter. Mitten scissor clamp is about five or six tools in one. And you can, might be able to see there, let's see here, put it up against my head. There's a little spike right there. And that spike, obviously, if you've got some glue in the eye of your, of your fly, you can just put the fly down there and run that spike through there and clear out the, the eye hole. And this is, I'm the only one that has this type of a mitten scissor clamp um with with that feature on it so they're really cool and we're going to be giving one of these away tonight at the end of the, the program here so um they're really something and i tell people they they think i'm joking but i'm not <clears throat> if you're going to buy one uh, buy one and try it see what you think but if you buy it if you buy it some more buy two of them because you're going to show your buddy and he's going to use it and that may be the last you'll see of your mitten scissor clamp so comes in two sizes five and a half inch and seven inch, okay? Best all around size is that seven inch. So I meant the scissor clamp, flybass.com. Um, so, okay, let's, uh, if you wanna, am I the host now or not? You're gonna make me the host? Yes, yes I did, Brad. Okay, okay. Okay, so we're gonna go over, we're gonna, let's see here. I'm gonna share screen and share. Now we're over here and, um, We've talked about we've talked about the um, we've talked about um, the, the blockheads and squirrel tails and stuff like that. Let's talk a little bit about um, my general approach to fishing smallmouth up here. And uh, drop down here um, for top water. Obviously, um, I'll, I'll, I'll I generally always start with a popper, <clears throat> almost always. Um, because let's face it, if we can get them on top uh, with a popper or something like that, that's generally speaking for most of us, that's the most fun way to, to fish. So start with, a, start with a blockhead, a gurgler, a hopper pattern, something like that to see if you can get those fish to come up and hit. I, I know a bunch of people that fish smallmouth south of me that wouldn't dream of using a popper unless it's like the last hour or two of the day and the, everything's calm and whatever else. I think you're missing out because as most of us know, fish will hit poppers any time of day. Um, but sometimes it gets better in the afternoon when the water warms up a little bit. Uh, but I always start there. And if I can't, and I don't fish them very long. If I, if I can't get a rise within 10 I, um, on a day on water, um, I'll, 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 I'll try something else. And generally the next thing I'll try is a, uh, a hopper pattern. This happens to be a hopper popper. It's kind of unique in that it's a hopper pattern, but it's got that cup face to it in the front. Um, see that? Yeah. So you can dead drift it um, and like a regular hopper pattern, or you can pop it a little bit like a popper. So it's got a lot of, a lot of utility to it. Um, and uh, these are made by uh, made for me by Rainies out of Utah. They're almost indestructible. You think a fly like this that fall apart after a few fish, and and, and they, they don't. The way they're tied, they're they're unbelievably uh, durable. And I've got a couple different ways to go with it. I, I'm not trying to blatantly uh, uh, do a commercial here, but these things are so cool. I got to show you guys. This is a what's called the Mega Hopper Popper Pack. I got different colors. These are big hoppers, and these are these are meant for for bass. Um, I've got a smaller one here. Um, hey, hey, Brad. Yeah. Is there any way you can get your put your picture back on the main screen Oops. from the? Uh... I did. I forgot about that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. Okay. This is called the um, uh, big uh, big trout bass selection, and it's got some it's got some hopper poppers in it. It's got some like a gorilla ants and Chernobyl ants and stuff like that in it. 
a little bit smaller, smaller poppers, but um, then I've got, as I said, I've got the, forgot about the thing here, but I've got these great big, make what I call a mega hopper popper. And, and these things, and I had to have them specially done by from Rainey's because we were getting fish coming up and hitting the smaller ones. The hook on the smaller ones works well, but we were losing some fish on them. So I wanted them to make me some great big ones with big number two hooks on them. And, uh, and they, they like these. <laughs> and, they're, and they're almost indestructible. Anyway, that's, that's, the mega, that's the mega hopper popper that we have. They're, they're uh, really unique. Uh, you can try to tie your own if you want to. But uh, anyway, if you don't, um, those are available. So once I've tried the, the, the surface stuff, and if it's not producing, um, and by the way, those hoppers I always, first I'll start by dead drifting them along the shore, hopefully by some grass or vegetation where hoppers might have a tendency to fall in the water. Um, but but uh, the fish come up and they'll, they'll, either, they'll either suck them in like a trout um, and then sometimes they'll blast them. So you never know, but it's fun. Um, I also use a fly called a gurgler. Most of you guys are probably familiar with a gurgler. If you're not, um, learn about a gurgler. That's a hell of a fly. And um, um, it was actually developed by a, a taxi driver in New York City who was tying flies on his steering wheel between trips. Um, and uh, it's just a great fly, fresh water, salt water. Just, it's just a piece of foam wrapped over the top with the lip up there and you can pop it or you can drag it. and a lot of different ways to work a gurgler, but that's a great uh, surface lure. So if they're not going top water, then I'll typically drop down into the top six to 12 inches with uh, something like, uh, this happens to be a, a Murdich minnow. It's just, a, it's just a silvery colored streamer and it's designed to run fairly shallow. Um, with those bright streamers like that, I can see them in six to 12 feet of water when I'm retrieving them. And either the fly will just disappear if a fish hits it, or you'll see the fish come up and turn on it. Um, but you know, streamers obviously are, are, are a great standby for smallmouth. And I'll usually have, I'll try a couple different colors for them, but I like bright a lot of times. And of course you can go with the dark, kind of a leech type patterns as well work great. Um, and we'll see, see how the fish react to a medium shallow running type fly. Now, if that doesn't work, and if I have to, then I'll, I'll do what I call dredging. And so I'll pull out the, uh, I usually pull out the good old uh, the clouser. Um, you know, they're so easy to tie. Probably one of the best flies ever invented. Uh, freshwater, saltwater. This one actually has a stainless steel hook on it, so I can use it for saltwater if I want to. Uh, the crayfish. Um, high tail craw, there's all kinds of crayfish patterns out there to try. A lot of guys love crayfish patterns. And uh, so then we'll go down and start working the bottom. Um, but here's the, here's the key. <clears throat> if, I, if I'm working my way down from top to bottom and I find something that works, say, say below the surface, I'll stick with it for a while. But couple hours later, a lot of times I will go back to a popper because you never know when those fish are going to start looking up. And um, it's very common up here where you're not going to, they won't hit a surface fly in the morning, but they will in the afternoon. And then you might have surface activity all afternoon, but you wouldn't know that if you stuck with that, that subsurface fly. <coughs> Excuse me. So don't be afraid to switch back and forth. And, and work your way back down again. We do it all the time and it can, can pay off big dividends. Um, and finally, as far as the approach goes, there are, there are days when, when they don't like flies. <laughs> and um, uh, I always carry a spin rod in the canoe or the boat. Um, and because maybe it's wh whoever else is in the boat, maybe they don't want to fly fish, that's fine. Maybe I'm tired of fly fishing or maybe fly fishing isn't working. And in which case, I'll pull out the spinning rod. And my, my, um, my two favorite things to use with a spinning rod are a, uh, this is called a, a mini Buzzbait Pro from Strike King. 
Okay, that's it. So it's not like a big, big buzzer like you'd use for big, large mouth and stuff. It's, uh, you know, it's much smaller. It's about eighth ounce. Now, the thing I do to doctor these things up is, you know, some of these, I don't know why they do it. It, it kind of pisses me off, but they, 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 um, they have that where you, where you hook on your swivel or you tie on or whatever there, and they don't have anything here to block it. Okay, let's see here. Let's see that. I take a piece of shrink, electrical shrink tubing, and I put it over there and I shrink it. And then that, that then provides a place where the swivel is going to, um, uh, the clip, clip or the swivel is going to stay there. And it's not going to run down the shaft or up here like, like they do in a lot of these. I don't know why these guys can't just put a twist in them or something like that. But that's uh, a little mini buzz bait works, works great. And then uh, a lot of times I'll use a, a chug bug. I, a lot of times I'll cut the front hooks off on them. One thing I don't like about crankbaits is that most of them have two sets of trebles, and I think they have a tendency to kind of hurt the fish a little bit. Um, so I'll, I'll sometimes clip off the top, but chug bugs can be real good. You can work them in different ways. And what's really, really strange um, up here, I found, there are days when, when the fish won't go for a subtly worked popper or, or a, a, a streamer or whatever and, and the fish seem to be turned off and i'll throw on a buzz bait you think this would be the last thing in the world that they'd ever hit but they will and i think it's like a reaction bite something like that um <clears throat> they'll come up and smash these buzz baits when when they've been ignoring everything else you've been you've been throwing at them all day so um that's kind of what happens when and then, you know, from there, sometimes, obviously, if we have to go underwater, then I'll put on, a, you know, spinners, some sort of blades, and maybe some mini crankbaits are good. Obviously, all that stuff is great for smallmouth as well. So a lot of different ways to go after these things, but I, I don't necessarily, uh, in my world, I don't necessarily have to fly fish. My goal is to catch fish. <laughs> and, and there are days when the, when, the, when the fish just, for whatever reason, don't like to fly. So... I'm always ready with something else for them. Probably one of the deadliest uh, presentations we have up here is a eighth ounce jig and a, and a white twister tail or something like that. Um, I, a lot of different ways to work those, but uh, smallmouth love them up here. And so we, we do go to that as well. Uh, let me get back to the other screen here. <clears throat> <coughs> Uh, real quick, uh, let's see if there's, oh, I just, I just had a couple quick things here. If you're interested, if anybody's ever interested, we do, I do sell a 12 pack of these uh, roadkill poppers that are already tied up. They have rubber legs on them. Um, this is the size of the lefties. Here's what they look like tied up. Um, give you an idea of the size. I also have a couple other different types. The poison ivy poppers are, they're tied by a guy named Kim Ivy down in Atlanta. And that's more of the conical bulbous type shape popper. This has a round body. I have a what's called a flat bellied here. Again, you have that conical face so you get a real good push with them. Uh, some guys just like these. Um, there's some of the, there's some of the uh, poppers. Then <clears throat> um, Minnesota, if you guys ever get up this way, uh, <coughs> Excuse me. One of the main things you're going to want to look for, if you're going to come up to Minnesota at some point, you got to you got to fish the Mississippi, and that's going to be in July or August. Okay. If you come up earlier, you're going to wind up probably on some of these tributaries. Um, but if you're going to come to Minnesota and, and fish for smallmouth, <clears throat> fish the Mississippi. There are some guides available up here if you're interested in in, in con connecting with somebody up here. I don't guide myself. Um, I do take people out on occasion, but there are some guides up here. And if, and if anybody ever has any uh, interest in doing it, you can give me a call and I'll, <clears throat> I'll tell you what I know about that particular guide. Uh, so uh, with that in mind, um, I'm going to spend a couple seconds talking about a getaway type trip. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, is there Bart or Terry? Is there anything else you guys need to jump in with here at all? Uh, no, I'm I'm good. I'm just just a reminder to hang around for a okay. chance to win. 
All right. Okay, well, here's what we're gonna talk about now. <clears throat> we talked a lot about, about the fly about fly fishing for small mouths, and and I don't think there's a better a better pursuit for us up here in the Midwest. Um, they're just, <clears throat> as you know, they're just dynamite fish. Uh, and by the way, there's no shortage of them either. I don't know what you guys, <clears throat> what your populations are like down there, but small mouth, there's more, there's more small mouth now in Minnesota than there's ever been. They have a tendency to get into a water column. I'll switch back here for a second. <clears throat> they have a tendency to get into lakes and stuff like that. They do very well um, to the chagrin sometimes of the hardcore walleye fishermen. Because there's some lakes that swamoths get into, and, and uh, they feel like they sort of take over the shallow cover, and so that that upsets the uh, diehard walleye fishermen. But lots of smallmouth opportunities in lakes and rivers, obviously in Minnesota. Um, okay, now we're going to jump into something a little bit different for you guys. <clears throat> I thought you might be interested in it. If you're ever interested in a kind of a warm weather getaway. Where you can take your basically your equipment that you'd use for smallmouth, and let me touch on that real quick. What we typically use up here on the Mississippi are eight weights. I know you guys will run five, six, and sevens depending on your water, etc. But on the Mississippi, it's pretty big water. Sometimes you got wind, and I like to fight the fish and get them in pretty quick. So we run eight eight weights almost all the time up here for them. If there's some sort of a hatch, mayfly hatch or something that will work, and I might drop down to a six um, or a seven or something like that, but most time it's an eight. You can take this eight weight setup <clears throat> down to Mexico and have the time of your life. So I'm gonna switch back over here. We're gonna talk a little bit about uh, baby tarpon fishing. <clears throat> okay, so here's the Northern Yucatan. And I've been tarpon fishing for, oh gosh, I've been tarpon fishing for probably 35 years, probably something like that. I started out in South Florida fishing for the giant tarpon. A giant tarpon is a fish over 100 pounds. Um, and and uh, way back when I started, um, it was it was good. Um, and you could get a guide down there for 450 bucks a day or whatever and go out and you had a shot at some some of these big silver kings and there's nothing like it. <clears throat> One of the unique things about tarpon that, that you guys may or may not know is that um, tarpon will take a, a, a relatively small fly. That streamer I held up earlier would be a common size for a baby and adolescent tarpon. And um, so you got a, you got a fish with a, a, a bucket size mouth on it that'll take a small fly three or four inches long. It's just incredible. Um, and what they do after you hook them, you guys have seen videos on them. Um, what they do after you hook them, and it doesn't matter whether they're five pounds or 150 pounds, they all do the same thing. And they spend more time out of the water <clears throat> than they do in the water half the time. So, um, so I got going, I got going on tarpon a long time ago and I kind of, <clears throat> I kind of burned out on South Florida and I'll tell you why. If you've got if you've got relatives down there, South Florida, uh, Fort Myers, whatever, the Keys, if you've got a good in for something like that down there, give it a shot because there's some big fish down there. <clears throat> but what's happened through the years is tarpon grow to be 50 years old. And so I I just think over time they they start to they start to um, get a little weary of fishermen because they make the same run every year up the coast. So I kind of got burned out on the Florida program. Um, the, the fishing was getting tougher. The guides uh, for a day on the water right now down South Florida, probably about 750 to $800 for a day on the water. And two guys, you know, for 400 bucks a piece, that's a lot of money. So what I've gotten into now lately is, is baby tarpon. Baby tarpon would be five to 15 pounds. <clears throat> And the juvenile tarpon, which we do get into periodically, would be 15 to 50 pounds. And, and they, would, they will literally, <clears throat> literally kick your ass. You hook them, it's all sight fishing. 
So you're in the bow of the boat, just like you've seen on TV. You're in the bow of the boat, and the guide will point out, you know, um, fish uh, 11 o'clock, 40 feet, fish coming come right to left or something like that. And then you'll you'll kind of home in on the fish, hopefully, and throw at them. And uh, um, hopefully you get hooked up. It really helps to know how to double haul. So if you ever go if you ever go down to salt water and, and you want to try this, you're going to want to know how to double haul. You got to be able to get the fly out there. But <clears throat> the best places to fish for baby tarpon are in the northern Yucatan, from Campeche all the way up around to Cancun. This whole shoreline along here is almost all mangroves. There's very little beaches. There's very little very little sand beach. So there's so all the sand beaches and stuff are over here on the Caribbean side. So all this up and around here is all mangroves. And this is where the tarpon uh, are born. This is where they grow up and they get to a certain size, <clears throat> about 15, 20 pounds. And then they join other schools of fish to start heading offshore. But they come back in every year in the fall and spend the whole fall and winter into the spring in... Uh, in and around the shorelines of Mexico. So what are we talking about? These, these fish that come back in that are bigger because they've been out in the open ocean. <clears throat> and um, that's my wife with a pretty nice fish. That's probably about 25 pounds. She actually caught this on a spinning rod out there because we'd fly fish in the morning and she, she felt better about spin fishing. But here's one I got about a year ago. Um, that's about 30 pounds. And then um, I was talking to my contact down there in Campeche, and I said, how is the fishing down there right now? So that's this last couple of weeks here in March, um, late February. <clears throat> he sent me these pictures. So this one here, again, these fish were probably born in the mangroves, and then they went offshore. This is almost a 50-pound one here. That's, that's really a big one. And then here's another picture of a couple of guys who were just down there about a week and a half ago. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so it's not unlikely in this area to be able to get into some really nice fish. A fish, these fish here, which are looking to be about, they look like they're about 25, 30 pounds. They will take you at least 20 minutes to land. So they'll get about six or seven jumps out of them. And normally you're going to lose them somewhere along the line in those first five or six jumps, um, which is what, one of the reasons why I leave the barb on for my tarpon hooks. Uh, you got enough stuff going against you with these things anyway. But it's just absolutely spectacular. <clears throat> and um, it's half the price of what it would cost in Florida. So for four, 450 bucks a day for a guide, um, you can go down there and, and, and uh, have a hell of a time uh, in Mexico. And by the way, when I was down there in December and the town that we were staying in, Campeche on the Western Slope, which is right here, it's a pretty big city. It's a, about 200,000 people. So they got a Walmart and stuff. But classic Mexico, <clears throat> it's not touristy and there's no crime like there is in Cancun. They were more COVID aware down there than we are up here. They had masks on the whole time for everything. They out jogging, they had masks on. So they were very good and it was very safe down there. And I was telling Bart, you, you go into Houston, you fly down to Merida, you take a shuttle down to Campeche. There's places to fish here. There's play, real lagartos up here, you know, whole boxes, all kinds of places around here. But the place to start is Campeche. So, uh, with that, I'll tie it off, guys. And if anybody has any questions, um, let me know. Please make sure you unmute your mics if you want to ask a question. I think everybody can pretty much <clears throat> go ahead and unmute your mics now if you'd like. So I got a question. When you're using those blockheads and you've got the different sizes, are you using the same size for the same kind of fish all year long, or do you go bigger as the season goes along? I'll use that. I'll use that medium size for smallmouth all summer. 
but a lot of times um, if it, it in the heat of the summer in August and so forth, August, if I was going to come to Minnesota and fish, if I was to pick one month to Mississippi would be August. Water's low, relatively clear, uh, warm. Um, there are a lot of days where we, we will go with the bigger one. Um, just some, sometimes they like a big one, you know. Um, but day in and day out, that medium will work all year round. Yeah, that, that would be the standby. Absolutely. Anybody else a question? How, how about colors? Do you do you prefer one color over the next? Or yeah, good question. I, I always start with yellow. <laughs> yeah. I don't know why. I just do. I, I just I like yellow. It's it's you know it's a proven bass color, um, but you know every color seems to have its day. And what's really kind of cool, <clears throat> um, and I can't remember how I got onto this, but but. Um, Carolina blue. I, we never used to carry it, but I had a guide down in Virginia that was asked, kept bugging me about Carolina blue colored poppers. And um, so I got some and we started using them about five years ago. That's about the only color my brother uses anymore. Well, it's uh, like a, da a damselfly, right? I mean, yeah, that, that, it's bigger, a bigger head, obviously, but it's the same yeah. color. That could be it. I don't know what it is, but there's days when white's good. There's days when chartreuse is good. There's days when black is good. Um, but if I if I'm going to carry flies, I'm always going to have a couple of yellow. Um, I'm going to have a, a, a and then a, like one of each of the other colors. You know, have them ready to go. Um, for whatever reason, I always start with with yellow. I know I, I guys that buy from uh, bodies from me. I just sold a, a, quite a few today. Guy wanted all black, so. You know, whatever your particular uh, preference is. But I just have, you know, I, I guess, <clears throat> I guess to take that one step further, um, some days color can make a big difference, as we all know, right? Um, but a lot of times, if, if they're not going to hit a popper, um, I might try, uh, if they're not going to hit a yellow popper, my general sense is, is that they probably don't want a popper. So I'll, I'll change categories at that point. And I'll go to a streamer or a hopper or something else. Um, but there are days when, when my brother's using a blue popper and he's, he's knocking the hell out of him. I'm struggling not very long with the yellow because I'm, I'm not, I'll switch if I have to. Um, but it's a, it's a good question. I start with yellow. You know. uh, got a question then based on that. Um, since the popper's on the surface and they're basically looking at a silhouette on the top, are you maybe changing? I mean, you said yellow, but you know, if it's a bright day as opposed to an overcast day, which may change the uh, the contrast uh, yeah. against the sky, would you do you even think about that or not really? If it's a if it's an overcast dark day, I I will almost always go to um, chartreuse or black. Yeah. Give you more my choice. Give you more silhouette and con contrast. My, 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 you know, I, I probably, uh, I like, I would probably go to black first. <clears throat> or uh, as well, if, if the water's real murky, sometimes in murky water, I'll, I'll go with black also. I, I think they can just see that black outline better when the light's not that great. Um, so, you know, the old adage of you know, bright sunny days, go with the bright sunny colors, that kind of stuff, I think can hold true. But if it's if it's murky water or if it's a if it's a cloudy, rainy day, I'll I'll typically go black or blue. Blue's good too on all around. <clears throat> if you were going to go with a streamer, say because you were talking before about the uh, white twister tails, but you know, so you'd think white white twister tails work. Maybe it's different when you're subsurface. You see a, a color difference in that in that case. Sure. <clears throat> you follow what you follow what I'm saying. I mean, if white. A white twister tail down is good, but you know maybe not as good on the surface. Um, I always start with a sort of a bright minnowy looking streamer, um, and I've got a number of different colored streamers in the box. I've got yellows, I've got chartreuse, I've got browns, you know, with flash and whatever else you want to put on them. <clears throat> but I, I, um, I've, I've caught we've caught so many fish, and the guys up in Menominee. On tight lines, 
Um, they've got like a Bart's minnow or something up there they use a lot for streamer. It's basically the same thing. It's a gray and white bodied streamer um, with, with tinsel tail, um, maybe a little bit of deer hair, um, stuff like that on them. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's just a great color fly to start with. Um, I always put eyes, um, you know, I always put eyes on, on them as well. Incidentally, <clears throat> on the streamers, when you guys, when you guys pop, put, put the eyes on the streamers, um, I, I, I always have a clothespin nearby. I put the glue on there and then I take the clothespin and use it as a clamp. Because if I, seems to me, if I use my fingers, I always get super glue on my fingers and I can't, I can't get the fly <laughs> off my fingers. But a, uh, a clothespin works really good for a clamp for streamer eyes. So that's not a, not a little, not a little tip I figured out through the years. So, so the streamer, you're, you're, you're doing a more of a, a minnow or a bait fish kind of thing. That's Absolutely. why you've got the white belly and what's on the surface is more of a terrestrial, you know, something that <clears> fell <throat> in the water and is flow again. You may see those as different colors, browns, yellows, greens. A frog, a frog or something like that. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. yeah. <clears throat> no, the streamer, the streamer, you're definitely generally going to be imitating <clears throat> some sort of a bait fish type thing, you know. Okay. Um, you guys use a lot of crayfish down there or not? Oh, yes, for sure. Yeah. It's the major uh, forage, I think, for smallmouth around here. Crays, yeah. Crawfish, yeah. Great. That's a great, that's a great flavor. There's a lot of great patterns for those. Um, and then do you use a lot of clausers also? Well, then the next best forage, I personally, I think are the minnows, you know, the bait fish. So... Yeah, the Murdish minnow is a killer, you know, around here for sure. Okay, good. Yeah. Yeah. Now that was originally developed as a saltwater fly. And a guy named Bill Murdich down in Florida for, for saltwater. And, uh, but they work everywhere. So that's a, that's a great fly. That, that's, kind of, that's kind of what that is. So. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, great flies. But yeah, if I, if I you know, the, as I say, I'll, I'll, first first fly I typically tie on would be a, a yellow a yellow popper try that if that doesn't work i'll try dead drifting um some sort of a hopper hopper popper type thing along the bank puts it a little bit if that doesn't work then i'll, then I'll, I'll go to the murdich mm -hmm. and if that doesn't work i'll go to a clouser crayfish pattern mm -hmm. and if that doesn't work i'll go to my spinning rod <laughs> 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 but i'll always i'll always kind of go back and see if through the course of a day, we all know things things change. You know, a fish will go like hell for an hour and a half, and all of a sudden it's like somebody's tripped a switch. And what happened to my fishing? Uh, it's pretty rare when when you're on the water for five six hours and they're biting like hell all day. Usually there's short windows of, of activity, and um, you know you got to take advantage of them when you can. I give you a tip, Brad, for uh, with your spinning rod, use up. A white fluke, those things to me, that's the go-to lure around here. That it's a never, never fails. A white fluke with a, a pointy lead head. Slide, well, I forget what you call it, like a slider head or something. But um, you, it, you jig it off the bottom, you pull it up. It just. <coughs> if I needed, if I needed one lure to live on, that's a, the white fluke. Is it? We floated down to Mississippi uh, about ten years ago a pretty good stretch of water and we're flogging 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 four or five hours very marginal fishing picked up a few fish we get down at the end there's some guys pulling in with another boat and we're shaking our heads we're going how'd you guys do and the guy goes no we did pretty good really what were we using and he holds up a, a jig with a white twister tail and they knocked the piss out of him and i <clears throat> i've never forgotten that <laughs> And I don't know what it is, but there's something about that combination. Um, you can work it a number of different ways too. You can you can retrieve it, you can bounce it, you can do all kinds of stuff with them. You know, the good Lord, when he, you know, I don't think there's anything better for fishing than some sort of a jig for multi-species. So yeah, you can't you can't lose with those. Okay. What's the uh, temperature like in uh, Mexico uh, this time of year? Right now, 
Well, right now, let's see, it's March. You're going to be getting up in the at least the mid 80s down there. Okay. Uh, I like to go down to. I like to go down and. I like to go down. I'd like to go down every month from October through April if I could. Um, if you, you you go down in, I've been down there in October, November, December, uh, and then like March and April. <clears throat> and uh, those, and the reason I go down there at those particular times is because <clears throat> the juvenile fish are going to be in somewhere. And, and sometimes, you, based on a condition, sometimes you can get out on them, um, and sometimes you can't. But um, I, I try to focus the trip on um, making sure that we have an opportunity to go after those bigger fish. <clears throat> because you can, if the weather's bad um, or whatever, there's always fish along the shorelines. And then you can go up into some of these rivers and creeks to get out of the weather. And there's tarpon up in those rivers and creeks too. So um, I, I had a buddy with me last December that really couldn't fly cast that well. <clears throat> so the guide took us up into a couple of these little creeks and all he had to make a 20 foot cast. Um, and the fish weren't, weren't that big, but he was able to hook up and fight a bunch of smaller tarpon and he had a ball, you know, mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> but I tell people, if you're going to, if you're going to go, down there um, and spend the money. Um, to, to give you an idea, <clears throat> um, the cost of, I usually go down to four for four or five days because I figure I'm gonna lose one day somewhere along the line uh, to weather or whatever. Um, but um, it's gonna cost you a couple thousand bucks for, for the week, which isn't bad because it's about 400 bucks a day, um, which includes lodging, fishing, breakfast, and lunch, okay? And you're on your own for dinner, which is fun because the Mexican restaurants down there are real Mexican restaurants and the food's fantastic. <clears throat> so somewhere between two and $3,000 for four or five days on the water down there, that's pretty reasonable, I think, for everything that you get. You can check out tarpentown.com. Um, he's the guy I go out of all the time. Every once in a while, I put together a group of about five or six guys. We'll go down there. We'll, 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 we'll charter out three or three of their boats. They use those, uh, 22 foot, what they call a panga. And, and they're just, they got a 60 horse motor on the back and they got a nice platform in the front and they're set up for fly fishing uh, or spin fishing too. Um, but you know, it's, it should, you should have it on your bucket list. If you've never hooked and fought a tarpon. Um, it's something that something you got to try sometime. Really, really fun. Ed, uh, how do you get from Merida to uh, Campeche? Did you you drive or do you? Uh... <clears throat> well, yeah. What what I do, um, right to go to Campeche. Now I've flown into Campeche from Mexico City, but in order to do that, <clears throat> you have to go through Atlanta, down to Mexico City, and up at Campeche. And you're sitting in the airports all day. Um, what, what I do now is that we, we fly down from Minneapolis to Merida, which is um, uh, the biggest city in the northern Yucatan. Okay. Modern city, nice airport, all that stuff. Um, safe. Uh, this, the Yucatan is probably the safest place in Mexico right now. Uh, everybody hears different stories about Mexico, but, um, and they're true you know, as far as the cartel and stuff, which is one of the reasons why I don't spend a lot of time in Cancun. Um, it's not really that dangerous compared to some of the places uh, on the West Coast. But I fly into Merida, and then they've got part of the trip cost is a shuttle from Merida down to Campeche. It takes about two hours. And uh, they run you into the hotel. Um, you get up the next morning, they usually have a breakfast, uh, like a buffet breakfast for you early. You eat that about 5.30, and then you're, you're, you're in the boat taking off at 6. <clears throat> you fish until about 3. And, uh, and then they got you back to the dock by 3, 3.30, 4, something like that. And you can just kind of, uh, you know, chill out and have fun and go out to dinner and do it all over again. Um, weather's pretty consistent and uh, a lot of nice people. So, yeah, that's, that's how we do it. 
if anybody has any individual questions or whatever um, <clears throat> about it, um, you can go on flybass.com. You can find information as far as how to get a hold of me, phone number, any ideas as far as when, how to go, kind of equipment, that kind of stuff. When I go down, I bring an eight, a nine, and a 10 weight. Because um, when you get into those big, big ones, um, it helps to have a nine or a 10, believe me. Uh, but you don't have to. Um, most of the biggest ones I've caught, I've landed on an eight weight just because I wasn't ready for them. So um, any, any kind of questions you have, you guys, you know, feel free. Give me a call, whatever. We'll... You, you better have a lot of backing on your reel, right? Pardon me? You better have a lot of backing on your reel. <laughs> well, you know, what? yeah, because what happens is you hook them, you'll get about five or six jumps out of them. And they're spectacular. You've seen the movies. And then, and then they get down and then they go. <clears throat> um, but you don't, the backing is not as big of a deal as people think. Because once they start going, um, uh, the guide will fire up the motor and you just chase them. You chase them and take up your line because they'll get out into the backing. And then you reel until you get them back on the fly line. Once you get them back on the fly line, you're getting pretty close to them. You're within 90 feet. So then they'll cut the motor and you'll, you'll start fighting them there. And then it's just a tug of war. Um, and even though they're right next to the boat going under the boat and all around, um, they don't jump as much, of course, after you've had them on for a while, but they will. Um, and, uh, uh, but yeah, everybody thinks you got to have a great big reel for, for, for tarpon fishing. And you really, you really don't because um, in most cases, you're going to, you're going to chase them. You're going to fire up the motor and chase them if they really go. So you catch up to them and then you fight them and hopefully you land them. And most of the time you don't, <laughs> if you don't land them, you just turn around and go try to find another one. You know, are, are these, uh, play, uh, do a lot of these places, uh, supply the equipment or are you bringing your own gear down? They've all, they've all, they've all, uh, would have equipment on board. Okay. <clears throat> most of them, are, most of them are tied up with, you know, one of the companies like, mm -hmm. uh, Temple Fork or something like that. You know, okay. so yeah, you, you wouldn't have to bring it, you wouldn't have to bring any tackle down if you didn't want to. So. Okay. Quick question for you, Brad. Yeah. Uh on those uh blockhead popper bodies and stuff, you, yeah. you sell the hooks, the kink shakes on your on your fly bass, right? I sell the hooks um as a separate entity, and then I sell what I call popper uh, popper kit. The right. proper kit is equal portions of proper bodies and then hooks. So 12 and 12 bodies, 12 hooks, that's a kit. Yeah, so you can buy uh, everything together if you want to. You know, I like the kink shank. I, I, I just think the kink shank keeps that body on there a little bit better. It doesn't right. turn as much as it would on a, on a straight shaft. Uh, so... Yeah, that's what I kind of love about your site because basically with everything, I think you have uh, it paired up with the hook that you suggest to go with it. <clears throat> yeah. Right? Yeah, you're going to, uh, there, there's information as far as what, what kind of hooks you want to use and whatever. And um, there's all kinds of different information on there. I've got about 40, I've got about 40 videos on YouTube too. Um, this link uh, over here, I, Am I share? I'm sharing. Yeah, this yeah. link right here, um, YouTube slash users slash flybass.com videos, um, all kinds of um, videos. You know, down in Mexico, um, most of it smallmouth, a lot of fly tying techniques, tips, stuff like that. So you can you can go on YouTube and and uh, check out some videos on there too. Are we going to win this tonight, Bart? Terry? Yeah. Are we ready to go on that? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Good. I've got right. all the names in a hat here. Well, I'm seeing we got 13 people here. So. All right. We have to be here to win, right? Right. All right. So I'm not looking. Tucker McElroy. Are you here? No. No? 
We're down to 12 now. Scared him away. Rich, is uh, Rich McElliott here? Yeah, I was just on the phone with him. He, his computer failed. <laughs> and he couldn't get back on. Oh, oh poor guy. Pull another wah, one. Wah, wah, wah. <laughs> Pretty good excuse, but, you know. <clears throat> Joe Augustine? There you go. Yeah, I'm here. All right. Hey, Joe, you need to send us uh, your email address or something, and uh, I'll get you in touch with Brad there. Okay. Joe, yeah, Joe, all you have to do is uh, – here, let me get back on here. <clears throat> Joe, all you have to do, if you would, would, would send your, your name address with uh, your email address as well, and just send that to me at salesofflybass.com. Okay. You know? Yeah, and I'll, I'll probably get an order on too. Okay, and the guy that – the guy that computer failed. Rick. I'll send you one too if you want to send me the information. <laughs> oh gosh, that's a whole week. Sorry, that's nice. I feel sorry for him. I saw John on the phone with the poor guy. So <laughs> I writes he should get one, right? So anyway, if, you to, if you want to send me his stuff, I'll I'll send him one too. All right, awesome. thank you, Brad. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, and then the winner of the fly box is uh, Chris. <clears throat> oh. Chris, uh, we got two Chris's. Just regular Chris or Chris? This is the uh, just the regular Chris. Okay, and I don't Chris. I don't think that Chris is on here anymore. Oh, I guess it's Chris the iPad Chris then. Chris iPad hey, yeah. is Chris Pop. Chris iPad is Chris Pop. Okay, that's you, Chris. All right. All right. Awesome. You got a little fly, nice little uh, Plano fly, fly box. There it is. John's showing it there. Let's see. I can't see it yet. Oh, John, you got to talk. Oh, I got to talk. All right. <laughs> um, there you I'm go. Unmuted. I don't know why I'm not. I'm not taking the screen. So. Oh, that's perfect. Yeah, I see it. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's a nice uh, four by six, uh, kind of a cloth covered uh, fly box from Plain. Awesome. Okay, great. So, Chris, shoot me an email. We'll figure out how to uh, get it to you. Okay, sounds perfect. Thanks a lot, Chris. I think you still have you still have the same uh, old email, I think, right, John? Yes, sir. You've had the same for a while. Yep, yep. J. Dale Lobach. Okay. Let me make sure I got that. Hey, congratulations! I got, your phone. I got you. your phone number anyway, so. Yeah, or give me a call. Maybe we get a chance to actually fish this year. Hey, and Bart, we got to do the second half of uh, of the river we never finished a couple years ago, too. Oh my gosh, you're you're exactly right. You're exactly right. <laughs> Hopefully, we'll get a chance to uh, try that sometime. Yeah, for, absolutely. Uh, that'd be uh, wonderful. I should be having my boat back here uh, pretty soon. I don't I don't have it back yet, but uh, uh oh, what'd we'll, you do to it? Run oh, into something? It's in storage. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's in storage. Oh yeah, we got all we got all year. I'm sure we'll find it. We'll yeah, find but I, I hope to get it out within the next few weeks. Sweet. Okay. So, yeah, but definitely we'll hook up and do that. Great. Hey, Brad, oh, really, really appreciate having you on tonight. Outstanding job, you bet, sir. Guys, nice talking to you. Yeah, Thanks. nice talking to you guys. Let me know if you need any more Thanks, information. Brad. Thanks, Brad. Yeah, Thank you. Guys. All right, adios. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. All right. You take care. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Bart. Nice job.